Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much to the organisers. Um, uh, it's a great conference and a great opportunity to network and, and meet one another, <coughs> especially for those of us that are travelling from the other side of the world. My journey into this space has been an interesting one. I started uh, as a development practitioner and then ac uh, um, academic, working largely on uh, development and you know, poverty alleviation um, uh, work in Myanmar. Uh, and then, of course, uh, working in the western part of Myanmar, uh, where the Rohingya uh, have uh, you know, suffered ethnic cleansing in recent years, uh, and focused on projects and work around the Rohingya, seeing the the Buddhist, excuse me, Buddhist version of extremism uh, being mobilised and weaponised as part of that campaign to to uh, to turn the population and uh, against the Rohingya and uh, uh, to drive them out of the country to justify the military excesses there. Um, has been, you know, so that, that's been my journey into the CVE space and it's been um, uh, fairly recent in that sense. So I'm really enjoying the opportunity to network and learn. I feel like I'm playing catch up in a whole new discipline for me. Um, but hopefully uh, this presentation and talking through the research we're currently doing will be really useful. But you'll see that uh, I'm, I'm coming and bringing some very development sort of ideas uh, to this and I think that's probably the strength of our project. So, um, preventing or countering violent extremism, there's a growing, uh, growing, well, the last decade really have seen, you know, I'd say, increasing calls um, for more holistic approaches that include more upstream work to prevent radicalisation before it even, uh, you know, and, and messaging and so on before it even gets uh, an opportunity, uh, and, and, and to you know, build res uh, resilience and so on, and then downstream, obviously, to disengage. So. We know that there's, there's some, some, some things we know quite well, I think, that underlying grievances and conflict can crush the sort of legitimate uh, aspirations and, and con uh, uh, as a contributing factor, uh, and that uh, partnerships with communities is, uh, and civil society is essential if we're going to um, build resilience uh, and, and, and really engage. So that brings us to the question then of development agencies. And when I use the term development agencies here, I'm talking about... NGOs and CSOs that focus and would describe themselves as development uh, oriented. There's a, a whole range of organisations that have been doing CVE work for a long time and engaging very well with that. But in, in, in my observation, uh, in our observation, um, there seem to be two very distinct camps here. There's those that do engage with development, uh, sorry, do engage with CVE and those who, who have, uh, until fairly recently at least, stayed out of this. Um, uh, and describe themselves in, in terms of, uh, you know, being development or community-focused, community-led, uh, community-oriented sort of programming. Um, theoretically, there's, uh, they, uh, the development uh, agencies might be seen as, as a great fit. They work on social inclusion, they work on, on participation, they address um, marginalisation and discrimination. Many of the things that we know are underlying uh, grievances that can fuel recruitment and, and radicalisation. Um, official development assistance globally uh, last year um, passed the 200 uh, billion US dollar mark, um, just kind of showing the, the amount of money that is being uh, invested uh, in what is broadly seen as development. Um, uh, development NGOs have an almost 20% share of that, and, and this is official development assistance, so this is from uh, government donors as opposed to private fundraising by NGOs. So this is, is a huge sector that is working on the very things that a lot of CVE programming, certainly at the, the broader level of CVE programming is wanting to address, but is a sector that um, really hasn't thought much until now, I don't think about countering violent extremism uh, or analysing the context in they, within which they work for violent extremism dynamics. Um, and I'll come back and talk a bit more about that, but um, the, the, the development sector has known for a, you know, and, and talked for a long time about conflict sensitivity and the fact that if you don't analyse a context for its conflict dynamics, then you're probably going to have unintended negative consequences of your programming and almost certainly missed opportunities for very minor changes to programs that could make a significant difference. Um, so with that in mind, 
Um, I, I'm proposing, we're proposing out of this project that um, uh, conflict sensitivity may actually, uh, or, or an expanded version of conflict sensitivity may be a nexus that can help um, CVE and development come together in really fruitful, productive sorts of ways. But of course, uh, well not of course, uh, development agencies have long had an aversion to working in this space and I think that's largely because uh, development NGOs, maybe more than the multilateral organisations and so on, have uh, uh, framed their legitimacy very largely around the idea of independence and being pro-community um, and that often needs advocacy against government and state um, actors and that a, a link with CVE work feels like it might risk that uh, very source of their legitimacy. Um, so we've got this, this project, it's a four-year project, as you'll see we're about two years in looking at these four countries, Philippines, Indonesia, Mozambique, Kenya, funded by the Australian Research Council and our partner agency in this is Plan International Australia, but partnering with their, um, their, their national offices in each of those four countries. We've also uh, expanded the framing rather than talking about violent um, extremism and countering violent extremism as, as our primary way of framing this to also include uh, or, or to primarily focus on hateful extremism and I'll get to why in a minute, um, which we define in terms of toxic nationalisms, intolerance of diversity, hate speech, mis misogyny um, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, gen anti-gender you know, um, uh, kind of messaging. So the, the five aims of our project are listed here in terms of exploring terminology and frameworks because terminology again of violent extremism uh, is, is often highly prob problematic for um, community level sort of and, 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 and civil level sort of programming uh, for these agencies. To map the dynamics in the four countries that we're working with to, to give back to Plan International um, but primarily to develop the sort of analytical tools that an agency like Plan International could take and use as they think about designing new programs and, and projects and, and think about uh, tools that, that help them to account for uh, violent extremism dynamics, recruitment dynamics, etc., that they, they should be aware of and should account for in the way they design their programs. Uh, and then indicators on that. So our key premise is that um, development agency responses can't and should not try to police people's beliefs, but at the moment those beliefs start manifesting in uh, very divisive, um, hate-oriented kind of behaviours, certainly intolerance of diversity, misogyny, attempts to control others. That's the point at which we can and, and should, development agencies really should begin to engage in trying to prevent what might then lead to extremism and recruitment. We've done several rounds of, of field work and, we draw, and I'll draw on some of that but not drill into that too much. What I want to quickly do is to run over uh, a bit of a, a dynamics mapping uh, from the three countries that we've done extensive field work in at the moment and the reason uh, for that will become obvious later but, um, uh, and, and, and some of this might be fairly familiar to people I don't know. Um, but this is based on, on discussions with a range of um, CVE experts, development um, uh, leaders, CSO leaders and communities in the three countries. The first thing, in, in, in looking at the Philippines, is a real concern uh, outside of a f sort of official and leader, leadership circles about the ter terminology itself and the, the risk of flattening multi-dimensional conflicts to, to, to simply be about extremism. Uh, when there's communist uh, act activity and insurgencies and all sorts of other things going on. Most people see a, a good distinction between violent extremism and other forms of conflict like insurgency, but that they're so deeply intertwined it's actually hard to then talk about and describe and they're concerned about an oversimplification. Um, most would see that the, the grievances that extremists play on are very legitimate grievances. Uh, that do need addressing and are not necessarily well being addressed in, uh, at the moment in the Philippines. Uh, and and a, a real concern that at least at times that state security actors and others have themselves... Uh, it, it, and and this, the sort of language we often heard is that the state um, security services have themselves become terrorists at times. Um, it's certainly very complicated by, by clan violence uh, and, and indigenous uh, issues, persecution, you know, uh, conflict against indigenous peoples, but then also um, uh, violence that, uh, that spirals from that, as well as insurgency and, and communist activities across Mindanao. Um, 
So as one person described it to us, the conflict was already there before it was called violent extremism, before ISIS backed uh, activity in Marawi and so on. Um, uh, but um, uh, it, so it's always been there and it's, and it's largely been similar to this. Um, now we're using new terminology to describe it. Um, so Marawi um, siege six years ago um, was something that uh, was, was really multi-dimensional that included some real strong insurgency elements as much as uh, ISIS-backed um, extremist um, uh, activity as well. So recruitment in the Philippines, and I really sort of feel like I'm glossing over so much of the research here, but that's okay. Uh, it will all be published fairly shortly. Um, recruitment in the Philippines, um, until fairly recently at least, has been far more through kin kinship ties and through clan networks than it has been through social media, uh, make in stark contrast to some of what we've been talking about in the last day and a half. Uh, most of the people who were recruited, uh, at least until a few years ago, were introduced to violence through clan uh, uh, feuding and through insurgency, and then recruited into violent extremism, and, and then perhaps radicalised after they'd already been recruited, uh, rather than the radicalisation being the recruitment pathway. Massive number of firearms across Mindanao, um, sort of backing that up, I guess. Um, and the, the, uh, the triggers for violent incidents are almost all to do with, uh, with land uh, disputes, uh, territorial sort of land disputes that uh, really are sort of um, insurgent uh, and clan based um, maybe more than anything else. Uh, I'm not going to read uh, through every word on the slides uh, for, for the sake of time. If we flick over to Kenya, we see some really similar dynamics in, in Kenya where concerns about excessive um, state security responses uh, feeding into some of the animosities on uh, the coast region uh, and the perception that state actors have at times been just as bad as, uh, as the extremist groups themselves. And, and again, this is perception, okay? This is public sort of perception and key informant perception. Um, and again, an, un an understanding that the key grievances are largely legitimate. Um, and need to be addressed but aren't necessarily being well addressed. And again, concerns that the use of the terminology itself can be inflammatory. Um, uh, so again, land disputes between pastoralists and nomads um, being central to a lot of the violence that happens, uh, as well as election campaigns sort of induced political violence um, being relatively central. The narratives that tend to be used to drive it are that of a Muslim minority who are suffering at the hands of a coloniser majority, more Christian uh, population. It's not so much the, the international Western coloniser uh, within, within Kenya, it is the majority more Christian group colonising down to the, the coast region and taking away Muslim land. Um, that tends to be played on. But again, it's land and, and, and so on seems to be quite central. Um, the Kenyan environment is, is extremely religious uh, and some of that religious, uh, even on uh, other sides, can be, can be very, very, very radical. Um, the example uh, in the last 12 months or so of uh, Pastor Paul McKenzie and the Good News International Church and the uh, Shikola Forest, uh, you may remember this, uh, 400 and I think 30 something bodies found buried in the, in the forest and the majority being children, uh, 600 and something was, well, that last, my last reading was still unaccounted for. Um, uh, a, 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 a past, uh, and, and this was because they, they fasted and starved themselves to death uh, in, in trying to purify themselves before Jesus was coming back, according to the teaching of that particular church. But while it may not be violence perpetrated against others, um, the inducing people to starve themselves to death um, is, is a form of extremism that, that is deeply concerning on a, from a Christian perspective um, there. So, so this sort of a fairly, fairly vulnerable sort of religious environment, perhaps. Um, so again, we're seeing, seeing some, um, uh, some strong similarities uh, in the Kenyan environment with, um, uh, with the Philippines. Indonesia is quite a stark contrast in many ways because at least across Java, there's not the same interlayering of different levels of conflict uh, with clan violence or insurgency violence, um, at least across Java. And this is far more sectarian, um, uh, it's sort of the, the intolerances and divisions that get manifest in Indonesian society are far more um, either different sects within uh, Islam, uh, different uh, forms of practice or um, sometimes with Christians and, and Buddhists and, and so on. Um, 
And so the grievances and narratives that tend to be played on uh, for recruitment are far, far similar to what we've been talking about for much of this conference uh, and play on maybe more Middle Eastern sort of narratives and, and the ideas of sort of global uh, coloniality, if you like, rather than something more uh, local. Um, I, again, you can read all the words on the slide. I'm not going to gloss, I'm not going to, to read everything there. As, as much as, oops, that was meant to be my next slide. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to, to give that um, sort of broad overview just to highlight from a development actor perspective um, some broad commonalities and, and some key sort of thoughts out of it. And the first is that the terminology of violent extremism is, is problematic across all three countries. Uh, for development actors, at least, um, that intolerance and hate are key uh, aspects, whether it is local sectarian driven or, or sort of uh, interlayered with those other um, insurgent-based sort of um, uh, yeah, issues. Um, it, at least two of the contexts, uh, violent extreme is deeply, deeply intertwined with other levels of conflict, such that it's really actually quite difficult to disentangle, um, and that recruitment draws heavily on mm -hmm. those other conflict grievances. Um, so the, where there are, the, are other conflicts, uh, in particular, our tentative conclusion is that violent extremism analysis, by, like when, when development NGOs are wanting to plan what to do, that, that embedding it within the analysis of, um, of conflict that they are already doing to some extent and wanting to do much better uh, is, is uh, the, the, the primary um, uh, or the, the most useful way forward, perhaps. So um, effective programming, just looking across those, those um, three contexts, the sorts of effective um, programming for um, development NGOs to undertake, there's a whole list of activities there that have come out of this, which are th all things that uh, development NGOs are generally doing anyway, um, but there's a broad recognition that all of these can and will um, uh, help address violent extremism at this sort of public, broad, all of population sort of a level that development NGOs uh, work at really well. And so this is my last slide looking uh, at, th at this idea that perhaps do no harm or conflict sensitivity as it's described in the development sector um, is the nexus to kind of bring this to together in, a, in the sense of being able to extend rather than invent new um, frameworks and, and toolkits. Uh, there's a broad recognition that uh, conflict always impacts on development projects and development projects always have some impact on the dynamics of conflict uh, and so uh, accounting for that and planning that from the outset is really important and I think that translates very neatly uh, for violent extremism uh, and certainly wanting to um, uh, avoid unintended consequences and maximise the po positive benefit. I'm going to leave it there because all the rest of the words are on the slide. Um, so I'm Leanne Kelly, also from Deakin University, working on this same project with Greg and Anthony. Um, and as part of that, we wanted to do a systematic literature review just to see what other NGOs were doing and what sort of evidence was already out there for what we were looking at in these four countries. So I'll just be discussing the, um, li the, literature, the literature review that we've been doing and the key themes that have come out of that. Um, so we've looked at all different types of sources as well, not just journal articles and books, but also industry papers that many of the people in this room have written as well. So if you've written about development NGOs, I've probably included you in the literature review, and if I haven't, I would like to, so <laughs> that would means that I've missed something. Um, so the key themes that we've identified are from 110 papers at this point, and there's another 90 that the data's been extracted from that will get integrated as well shortly. Um, so interconnections focuses on the nexus between development and PCVE, as well as terminology and resourcing. Power and relations um, is about stigmatisation, coordination, localisation, trust and marginalisation. And then impact focuses on sustainability, effectiveness, and monitoring and evaluation. So preventing and countering violent extremism should be integral to the work of development NGOs as insecurity directly threatens poverty reduction, stability, and economic growth. Um. So the connections between violent extremism and development go both ways. Security is necessary for development and insecurity reverses development gains. But also push and pull factors that help drive people towards committing acts of violent extremism are the same conditions that development NGOs seek to ameliorate. 
So by working to address individual and community needs and social issues such as poverty, exclusion and injustice, development NGOs are tackling the root causes of violent extremism. Despite all these inter interconnections, authors in the SLR caution against development NGOs blindly repackaging development projects as PCVE without specifically considering the intricacies of PCVE, noting that NGOs who have tried this approach have had mini minimal impact on PCVE goals. Terminology was raised in almost all of the papers in the literature review, with all authors noting the problematic nature of terminology and its appropriate usage within communities. Authors highlighted that the PCVE framework relies on outdated ideas of a consistent pathway to radicalization and tenuous links between ideology and violence, which can be seen as contextually insensitive and interfering. With this meaning imbued in the terminology, the use of PCVE labels can undermine NGO activities and alienate community members. Community members may feel offended by the malignment of their ideology or their group, or they may fear retaliation from local violent extremist actors. <coughs> Additionally, community members and partners may become suspicious that the NGO is working within some governmental or broader agenda. Um, while no papers provided clear solutions to the terminology problems, they did highlight the importance of differentiating between CT and PCVE and distancing NGOs from securitised approaches. The papers recommended that donors, NGOs and communities should develop suitable context and conflict sensitive definitions of PCVE that replace terms such as extremism with more neutral terms such as social change, personal development, peace messaging and coexistence. Stigmatisation was noted as a major theme whereby subgroups felt that they were targeted for PCVE. This targeting and over-monitoring of certain communities is unhelpful and inaccurate, especially as paths to violent extremism are unclear and over-surveillance can backfire and become a violent extremist push factor in itself. Experts at a round table reported in one paper overwhelmingly agreed that grievances are the root of radicalisation and that the disproportional attention given to ideological factors by PCVE policy makers and experts is hindering progress on prevention. Identifying ideology can have adverse effects as demonising people's beliefs can distance those everyday people that NGOs might want to be engaging. Further, extremist groups leverage examples of religious profiling and persecution to generate sympathy and support for their cause. One paper noted the need for law enforcement agencies to be vigilant in investigating and persecuting civil rights violations and anti-Muslim hate crimes in order to regain trust of communities and NGOs and to actively combat the impression that Muslims are responsible for most violent extremism. Authors noted that the focus should be on all forms of violent extremism, including Western-centric, anti-government, right-wing and white supremacy. This equal approach should be communicated to the public to avoid targeting Muslim communities. Many of the papers recommended that there needs to be better coordination and collaboration between NGOs, governments, communities and other stakeholders in development NGOs' implementation of PCVE activities. They recommended that stakeholders should convene regularly through platforms such as network meetings and integrated communities of practice. National and international actors should support locally led work, building local capacity and partnerships. Stakeholders should have clear lines of responsibility and understand their role and how that interacts with other actors in the space. Government can support coordination by acting as a backbone institution and being aware of what is happening on the ground by taking time to listen and know communities. Governments can also improve coordination by removing barriers and red tape that impact the effectiveness and efficiency of NGO operations. The need for PCVE work in development NGOs to be driven from the bottom up was clear in the literature. Local groups equally, uh, they usually have better rapport and trust in the communities where they work, as well as largely being comprised of local staff with deep contextual knowledge. Via this model, external organisations can ask, how can we help support you? And in line with that answer, externals can work with and not for communities, helping build community capability to design and deliver locally led programs that respond to contextually specific push and pull factors. 
The findings indicate that these local approaches result in better implementation, impact and sustainability. Trust, or a lack thereof, was a large theme in the literature review. There are multi-directional trust deficits between government, NGOs, communities and other actors. Due to communities' lack of trust in the government, NGOs may fear community rejection when working with government, but without government approval to operate, community members could be too scared to engage with NGOs in many contexts. Many NGOs advocate oppositional or critical beliefs regarding the government and its policies, which may strain relationships and hinder collaboration with the government. <coughs> this can result in government distrust of NGOs involved in advocacy and suspicion of wrongdoing, which can then lead to a chilling effect on donors. It's noted that NGOs often have a positive relationship with communities and that PCVE activities are more likely to succeed if this relationship is prioritised with the NGO engaged from the outset to enable time for the development of trusting bonds and local knowledge. As staff attrition and short funding cycles that result in program closure have a negative impact on trust, donors could support trust building through providing long-term funding. Trust building requires strong and inclusive programming and facilitation. This could include steering away from some counter-narratives if the counter-narratives undermine beliefs widely held in the community. There needs to be a safe space for exploration of ideas, even unpopular ones. Including diverse stakeholders in decision-making and treating people as co-creators rather than beneficiaries can help develop trust, particularly when this is done authentically and with adequate time and other resources allocated to it. There were no surprises in the literature review in terms of resourcing, with most papers noting that funding was insufficient, short-term and tied to particular uses. Further, there was an over-reliance on foreign donors and no sustained funding stream for scaling up pilots. Funds focused on projects rather than NGO infrastructure and personnel. Clearly, NGOs prefer flexible funds for operating costs rather than tendering to deliver an externally designed, time-limited project. Having more control over their funds would support NGOs to invest in things such as capacity development for their staff and partners around conflict management, PCV frameworks, project management, communications and monitory and evaluation. Um, a very glaring gap in the literature was that there was little to nothing on Indigenous LGBTQIA plus or disability. And although there was quite a lot of talk about gender, that really meant women. And the literature argues that we should main, mainstream consideration of women into PCVE work. There was a strong agreement across the papers that there needs to be more attention paid to ensuring sustainability through succession planning and through building in reflection and processes to enable adaptation for improvement and Im emerging issues. This requires long-term funding to give time for PCVE programs to become established and for resu results to show. The effectiveness reported throughout the SLR papers was mixed, although several of them reported participant gains in tolerance for different perspectives, knowledge and confidence. Despite showing some positives, many of the results were unconvincing. For example, El Masri and Slavona examined several sites and found that across organisations and approaches, with few exceptions, there was no evidence that the interventions were contributing to PCVE. A meta-analysis of eight outcome evaluations found that the effects varied strongly across included studies. Other papers overclaimed the meaning of their results. For example, a project with 21 participants claimed that the combined assessment results evidence that the program was effective at reducing and preventing violent extremism. <laughs> it's a bit of an overstatement. As shown via the previous examples, the results of PCVE programs included in the literature review were highly mixed, ambiguous, overstated, and often based on outputs with impacts assumed. Um, for example, there was one where 2,000 people saw an art installation and it said that then that meant that they had an awareness of extremism. <coughs> Some programs chose indicators they wouldn't directly influence which were dependent on other external factors. Outcomes and indicators should always be aligned to what is within the scope of the program and the implementing organisation to affect. 
Programs can measure increased resilience, social cohesion, understanding, access to resources and other things like that. And many of the programs showed statistically significant change on these. The missing link is evidence supporting assumptions that these outcomes contribute towards PCVE. The majority of papers remarked on the lack of quality monitoring and evaluation in PCVE, the difficulty of evaluating preventative outcomes and impact, and the limited evaluation capacity among NGO personnel. Baselines and theories of change were rarely in place, and most of the evaluations were conducted ex post, so just at the end. Um, it was noted that PCBE relies on largely untested assumptions with insufficient evidence of what works for who and in what contexts. To address the weak monitoring and evaluation systems in PCBE programming, the papers suggested that organisations should ensure that monitoring processes linked to theory of change outcomes and indicators are in place and operationalised from program beginning. Further, NGOs should conduct regular needs assessment and conflict analysis and gather this information as monitoring data. Evaluations that showed the most robust results evaluated skills, awareness, behaviour, attitudes, social cohesion and resilience, rather than attempting to measure a decrease in potential violent extremists. To link these measurements to the objective of reducing violent extremism, there needs to be deep evaluative research conducted to excavate the assumptions beneath PCBE. For example, there needs to be stronger evidence that increased tolerance of difference, community connection, inclusion, etc., contribute to reduce violent extremism. So that's the end of my presentation, and we're going to be hopefully submitting this project by the end of this year, so it should be published in 2024, <coughs> all being well. I'm sure it will finally be done by then. So <laughs> thanks very much. Thanks, Leanne.